Welcome to another episode of Elevated Minis. My name is Cody and today we're going to be painting up the Gloom Mini from Adrian Smith's special guest box that's compatible with both Zombicide Black Plague and Greened Horde. Um, I'm only showing one of the abominations from this box to save some time, but I use the exact same methods and colors for both minis. If you head over to my Facebook or Instagram page, you can see the final result of both miniatures. Hope you guys enjoy the video. And standard procedure here prime the model in a color of your choosing um, I tend to prefer black in most cases because I'll usually do some sort of zenithal undercoat to help me see where to put the highlights but I don't always use black and white as you'll see in the, with the next step so my wife and I were really into Game of Thrones up until the final season which is a conversation in its own right but I really love the white walkers from that series and this model really felt like a walker from beyond the wall to me so this was my attempt at recreating that look and feel and uh, like my last miniature painting video um, I'm using the Malefic Flesh paint set to undercoat the model starting with frozen flesh since the skin is a majority of the model it'll save me time in the long run and I'm notoriously slow at this stuff so any time saver is a great for me you could layer these colors up with a brush if you wanted to and they would look just as good With this video I wanted to try and focus my channel a bit more to kind of mirror what I have going on in my homebrew D&D campaign that I run for my family. We only play once in a while because I put way more effort into it than any normal sane person would. Um, I just want it to be this epic game experience that my wife and kids will always remember. Games are a great bonding thing for us so I'm sure my family will make an appearance on this channel at some point. And continuing on with that Zenithal undercoat I'm using Cold Flesh. Uh, spraying at a 45 degree angle but uh, continuing on about my D&D campaign we're going to a frozen landscape so this is the kickoff to a new series on my channel where every video and it will be either a winter themed miniature or piece of terrain as well as having its own background music that I wrote to suit the atmosphere um, if you happen to like the music you can head over to my SoundCloud that I'll have linked down in the description where you can hear all of my tracks there as you can tell, these videos are a lot of work and time, but I want to take you guys along with me on this adventure. So if you enjoy them, um, it would really help me out if you hit that like, subscribe, and bell button to help grow this channel. Hopefully you'll get inspired to try some of these ideas in your own games. And uh, also, if you're interested to know what I'm working on, check out my Facebook page where I'll be trying to be better about posting more regularly uh, to keep you all in the loop, as well as post progress shots of what I'm working on. It's also probably the best way to get in contact with me if you'd like. And for my final Zenithal highlight, I'm using Pale Flesh sprayed directly from above and a few more spots that I felt like needed a bit more light. Um, just make sure you let this completely dry before moving on to using your brush. I wanted to tint the skin blue and make his skin seem like it had been frozen for quite some time so I used a 4 to 1 mix of Dreckenhoff Nightshade to Nuln Oil and thinned it down with about 4 or 5 drops of glaze medium. I wanted to make sure I kept the light values on the skin from the previous step intact so it would be easier for me to see where to put the highlights. And after letting the wash dry, I thinned down some cold flesh and uh, mixed it with some glaze medium again to bring back some of that original skin color while keeping the wash in the deepest recesses. Thank you. 
And it's the same idea here. I'm using pale flesh and I highlighted the highest points on the face, like the cheekbones, the eyebrows, just to bring out those facial features. Uh, since it's just a light color, it may not show up uh, the best on camera, but uh, you can kind of see it there. And for my final highlight, I'm using a one-to-one -one mix of pale flesh and bone white. I just wasn't 100% happy with um, how it looked with just the pale flesh, and I thought it could uh, go up a little bit more. So I just focus mainly on the sharpest edges here, and uh, you can see it really pops it out and makes it look nice. And for the fur coat, um, I made the mistake of not hitting record on the camera, and this happens to be one of the coolest and fun parts of the model. <laughs> Hope you guys can forgive me for that, but I did catch the end of it at least when I realized a mistake. If you guys really want me to show you every part of this, I'll make a separate video on it. I think I have another zombie side model with a fur coat on his back. Um, just let me know in the comments. Uh, I used some retarder medium with the paints to give me a little more working time to blend the colors. It sounds way more complicated than it is. It's really just slapping the colors on and blending. I put the heavy charcoal on first at the top of the fur coat, followed by heavy blue-gray, and then I blended them together where the two colors uh, meet. And then using the same process, I used bone white to blend into the heavy blue-gray. And you can see me um, kind of doing that here, just kind of swirling my brush around just to get a nice blend. With the skin and fur coat finished for now, I'm doing some base coating, starting with the leather pieces. I'm using charred brown. Um, there's a lot of it, so take your time. Uh, keep your brush moving while applying the base coat, and you'll get a nice solid color. If you thinned it a little bit too much like I did, just apply another layer. Better to be too thin than too thick. After the leather, the belts, and the wood handle of the sledgehammer were done, I moved on to base coating all of the future metal parts like the hammer head, um, the belt buckles, and the few armor plates there are with black. It's pretty simple here. Just take your time with it and uh, it'll look good. Moving on to the beard and the hair, I'm uh, base coating it with Glacier Blue. Um, it's a really nice cool white almost. It's really kind of hard to see on camera, but it definitely has this bluish tint to it. And it uh, never used it for hair before, but I thought it would look cool. And uh, I was pretty happy with how it came out. And to highlight the beard up a little bit, I used some ivory as well as uh, I also highlighted up the hair. I probably should have wet blended this in hindsight, but it, it's all good. It came out just fine in the end. For the final highlight on the hair, I just used some dead white and I uh, used the side of my brush just to try to uh, pick out a few of the individual strands of hair to uh, make them pop out a little bit more. I wanted to give this guy that hunter-gatherer vibe, so I ended up painting all of the uh, cloth areas with uh, base flesh like it had been an animal that he had previously killed. So I'm using khaki, and there's just a few bones sticking out on this guy's armor and uh, just use uh, khaki for this to base coat it and if you're wondering why <laughs> the guy's face is all bright it's because I thought it would be a smart idea to highlight it up even more but uh, I end up painting over it later to cover it up To make the leather look aged and worn, use your finest tip brush. I'm using a Beastie Brown here, but you can use any orangey brown that you have. And draw as thin of lines as you can along all of the edges of the leather. Um, don't start your lines at the same point for each brush stroke. Make some lines longer and others shorter. You don't want to be uniform and symmetrical here. 
Um, another option if you don't want to draw lines is you can tap your brush along the edge of the surface and that will give you a similar look. Uh, do whatever you're more comfortable with. I do a little bit of both and I'm not perfect at it either. Uh, most of this is just going to get covered as we go along. And for this next step, I'm using a 50-50 mix of Bone White and Beastie Brown. And I did the exact same thing as I did in the previous step. Um, I'm probably making the lines just a little bit shorter. Uh, just take your time. This is a time-consuming process, and it's going to look great in the end. And now I'm going along the edges of the leather with bone white. Um, if you're worried about this looking a little too bright right now, don't worry because we're going to be going over it with a glaze and uh, it's going to tone that right down. And just highlighting that bone up a little bit. I'm using ivory. I forgot to mention I had uh, one black leather strap going along this guy. And I'm using the same process that I did with the brown leather, only I'm only using uh, pale flesh here. Here's another easy step for you, just a uh, coating all of the black areas with gun gray. Um, it's a nice dark metal color and uh, we're going to be rusting it up in a later step. And here we go with an awkward camera angle, just dotting the eyes with some ivory. Eyes always make me so nervous. <laughs> I'm just not totally comfortable doing them, but uh, I'm pretty happy with how they came out on this model. So I really wanted this metal to look old and rusted, so to do the rust effect, I used the Vallejo Special Effects paint set that I'll link down in the description. But uh, using the color Dry Rust, I ripped off a piece of foam from a dollar store foam brush, uh, patted away some of the excess paint, and dabbed it around pretty haphazardly on the metal areas. The paint has uh, tiny granules in it that leave a nice rusty texture and color, so when you go back over it with a dry brush with the color Rust that's in the same paint set, it creates a pretty convincing effect. So here you see me doing that dry brush of rust here. I'm not being particularly careful. I'm just kind of mainly focusing on the edges of the various metal parts. And uh, it, it's when it, it might look a little bright right now, and uh, we're going to tone that down in a little bit later step. And then I just put a few um, little dots of gold yellow. Um, be very sparing with this. Um, and I'm not 100% sure I liked like this, but uh, it all turned out fine in the end. To finish off the wood, I just did a dry brush of uh, pale flesh. And then after that, I did a dry brush of ivory. And that was pretty much it. It's pretty simple. And here I'm using Agrax Earthshade to wash over all of the cloth areas. And uh, I also did the uh, fur coat in the back. I didn't do the leather because I was going to glaze over that with uh, charred brown in a later step, and uh, you'll see that. And here's the glazing step that I was talking about. Uh, it's a 4 to 1 mix of glaze medium to charred brown, which is the base color. And uh, it just really unifies all of the leather parts, and uh, more so than a wash would, because you're using those initial colors. So that's why I'm doing that here. And while I was glazing, I decided to go ahead and do the uh, wood handle here as well. You could have used the Agrax or shade if you wanted to, but since I had this going, I just went with the uh, with the glaze. 
So I just wanted to tone down the rust and the metal a little bit, and so I used the Nuln Oil, and it got into a few of the extra details that are in there um, before I moved on to highlighting. So to enhance the fur coat a bit, I did a dry brush of bone white. This is a real simple step, but it really kind of helps bring out the individual hairs of the fur coat. I think I forgot to uh, film the step where I used Seraphim Sepia on the bones, which gave it that yellowish color. So, uh, but yeah, I did that, but there's only like three little bones on this model and uh, I'm just highlighting it up with a little bit of ivory. So highlighting up this cloth a bit, I'm uh, using the base color of base flesh and uh, just leaving the wash in the deepest recesses. So moving on to a few more highlights here, I'm using a 50-50 mix of base flesh and natural flesh and uh, yeah. Pretty simple here, and just leave a little bit of the previous color behind while you're highlighting up. And here's that final highlight of natural flesh. And with ivory, I'm just hitting the few stitches that are on the cloth here. For the metal, I didn't really want to have like really bright highlights on it. Um, I wanted to keep it old looking, but I did want to have just a few spots that just kind of stuck out a little bit, like the little rivets on the gauntlets there, and maybe just a little bit of the edge of the hammer. So that was my thought process on this. So I wanted to add a different color of metal onto the shield here, so I picked a tinny tin from Game Color, and I also did a few of the uh, buckles this color, and also that armband. And to highlight those pieces just a little bit, I used uh, hammered copper, just mainly along those top edges. For a somewhat intermediate to advanced technique before we go to the base, I decided to try black lining for the first time. It's a technique I've recently become aware of, and this model gave me an opportunity to give it a shot. And as you can tell on this model, there's a lot of brown leather going on, so by black lining along the creases and bottom edges of everything, it really draws your eye to the individual pieces of leather and makes them stand out and pop. I'm using black ink from Dollar Rowney for this, but any black acrylic ink will work. I'll definitely be getting other colors to try lining with after trying this for the first time. Um, the reason why we're using an ink for this is because it has a perfect flow and opacity that's much more difficult to achieve than with paint. However, I'm pretty sure you could use paint if you didn't want to buy another product, but this really makes it easy when you're trying to get into tight details like this. You don't want to have to worry about paint not coming off of your brush properly as opposed to the ink. It's something you'll have to just try and see to see what I mean. And uh, one cautionary note about black lining is that it can make your miniature look cartoony in some cases if the colors you're trying to separate from one another are too dissimilar in either brightness or hue because it can be too stark of a contrast between them. Um, but however, sometimes that cartoony look might be something you're going for. I'll definitely be doing some more experimenting with this technique when I pick up some more colors, but I hope you guys like the result of this because it's the first time I tried it. You get to try and learn new things right along with me because there's a lot I don't know. It can be intimidating to try something new when you watch a pro do it, which I most certainly am not. <laughs> For the base, I coated it with Sterling Mud. I really wanted this base to look like it had been in a state of permafrost for quite some time, but I wanted the ground to have a bit of texture, so the Sterling Mud fit the bill for this. You could use sand and PVA if you don't have the Sterling Mud and just paint it dark brown to get the same kind of effect. After letting that dry, I used Steel Gray and painted over most of the base, but I intentionally left spots of Sterling Mud behind for some color variation. 
I then used Drakenhof Nightshade and completely covered everything to tint the entire surface a dark blue, as well as to get into all those details from the Sterling Mud. I let that dry for about a half hour and I came back in with a dry brush of sky blue and followed that with another dry brush of glacier blue. Now this wouldn't be permafrost if I didn't have some sort of ice going on, so for that I purchased a product called Distress Crackle Paint, a clear rock candy from Ranger. It's a crackle paint that dries completely clear and crackles once it's dried. I found it while searching for alternatives to crackle products like a ghrelin earth, but what makes this unique is that it's completely clear when it dries. The trick with crackle paints is that you get bigger cracks the thicker you put it on and smaller cracks with uh, thinner layers. So just experiment with it. I wasn't too concerned about it however and I just went for it. Let that dry for a few hours at least before coming back to it. So I'm not sure how well you guys can see the cracks but there's definitely some cool cracks going on on the base. This stuff does dry pretty brittle so you could probably chip this stuff off if you're using it heavily in game so make sure you cover this with some sort of varnish or clear drying glue to prevent that from happening but before we do that I'm going to go in with some dead white and dry brush the surface to bring out those cracks and make the ice look like it's a bit windswept I then went in with a uh, matte varnish in various spots and also gloss varnish in other spots because if you've ever seen ice out in the world, there's spots that are shiny and spots that are pretty dull looking. So this is my attempt at recreating that and I gotta say, I was pretty happy with how this came out. And I'm sure there'll be uh, other times when I use this technique in future videos. Once the varnish was dry, I rimmed the base with black and called this model done. I really hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. I tried a bunch of new techniques on this model and I got lucky with some decent results. Uh, I'll have some Amazon affiliate links down in the description for some of the things I used in this video and that earns me a small commission if you guys purchase the stuff using those links. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, it would really help me grow and let the YouTube algorithm know I exist. Uh, leave a comment, let me know what you think. Really appreciate you all taking the time to watch and until next time, Thanks again.